One announcement that has recently been overlooked is that OpenAI Assistance API finally supports streaming. I mean, so what it supports streaming? Who cares about streaming when we're all gonna get replaced by AI developers like Devin, right? Well, don't turn off this video just yet, because this feature plays a much larger role for production applications than you might think. To illustrate, a study at Amazon discovered that a mere 100 milliseconds of latency cost them over 1% of their sales. This, by the way, amounts to almost $900 million annually. So, in this video, I'll explain exactly what streaming is, why it's so vital for production, and how you can use it with both Assistance API and my own framework, Agency Swarm. Let's dive in. Okay, first of all, one of the reasons all the transformer models we use today, such as ChatGPT, are unidirectional is because of the support for this exact feature. What makes these models so practical is that they can examine all the previous words and begin generating new words one by one, unlike bidirectional models which require entire sequence for processing. So, on the OpenAI side, streaming makes absolutely no difference, because whether you use it or not, the output by these models is still generated word by word. However, on the client side, it can make all the difference, because the way you get this output dramatically affects the user experience. To understand exactly how it affects your users in your specific situation, you must first understand the difference between latency and response time. Often, these two terms are used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. The response time is what the client sees and latency is the duration that a request is waiting to be handled. So, when comparing streaming and non-streaming approaches, the total response time may remain essentially the same for both. However, it is the latency that matters, because this is what the user perceives to be the waiting time. For instance, if generating a full response takes a total of 10 seconds, the total response time would be approximately 10 seconds in both streaming and non-streaming approaches. However, in the streaming approach, the latency can be very low, potentially close to zero. This means that the user will get value from this interaction almost immediately, which significantly enhances user satisfaction and engagement. Now, what are the types of applications for which you should and should not use streaming? Well, Definitely any external applications that use some form of a front-end to interact with the AI in real time should always use streaming if possible. For example, even on our own SaaS platform, this has been one of the most requested features from the very start. With AI integrations like a website widget, you potentially only have a few seconds in total before the user leaves. So waiting for an entire response might not even be an option. This is why we are personally prioritizing this feature next. So if you're curious about how we are implementing it specifically, make sure to stay until the end. For internal applications that are used only by your employees, on the other hand, streaming can make absolutely absolutely no difference. This is because your own employees most likely already understand the value of the application if it was developed specifically for them. So they're a lot less likely to leave. Backend integrations where there is no user interface like data analysis applications do not need streaming at all because the user interaction is asynchronous anyways. So now let me show you how to implement this feature with the new OpenAI Assistance API. The process for generating streaming completions with Assistance API is actually much harder to implement than in all previous OpenAI endpoints. And if you think about it, it actually makes perfect sense because in all previous OpenAI endpoints, there was only a single event, which is the next token generation. But in the Assistance API, there are many different events. Like for example, executing your code with Code Interpreter on the backend, retrieving files or using other custom tools and then submitting tool outputs. All of those are various events that need to be handled handled differently. However, don't be discouraged yet because after you understand why it's implemented this way, it actually becomes very simple. And to do so, make sure to open the notebook in the description and follow this tutorial with me right now. This way you'll be able to test it out yourself and get all the concepts much faster. Okay, first let's install the packages and set the OpenAI key. After that, so you can feel the difference yourself, let's revisit this feature with the previous chat completions API. All it takes in chat completions is literally just setting the stream parameter to true. Now, instead of a complete response, we get a special Python generator object. To get the text from this object, all we have to do is iterate through it in a loop and print the delta value, which is basically the next generated token. That's how simple it was with the previous chat completions API. 
However, don't forget that with this API, you have to execute all your logic yourself after the generation is complete. So although the streaming response generation in this API is much simpler, if you try to implement a feature like code interpreter yourself, you'd find that it would be not just more difficult, but almost impossible to do by yourself. There are even startups like Notable, where the main functionality of the platform is literally just one feature in Assistance API. So now let's implement this ourselves with Assistance. All the steps for creating and running your assistant are basically the same, only the last step differs. First, we initiate our assistant with some instructions and capabilities, we can give it a name, description and so on. Second, we create a thread. Third, we need to add a message to this thread. Now, fourth, this is where it gets interesting. To stream your completions, you need to create a new event handler class. In this class, we need to define special event handler methods. Each of these methods is called based on the specific event it corresponds to. As I said, because there are many different events, we can't just iterate through them in a loop. We need to handle each event differently. So, for example, on text created is called when your assistant starts to generate text for the first time, and it makes sense to print the assistant name. On text delta is called when the assistant generates the next token in this text. You can get this token from the delta value, or you can get the complete response up to this moment with the snapshot value parameter. The event on tool created is triggered when your assistant decides to utilize a function. So you can print the function name, for example. Meanwhile, on tool call delta is activated when the assistant begins to generate arguments or even execute some built-in capabilities like code interpreter on the backend. There are also many other events that you can find by browsing the code for OpenAI package on GitHub. For example, on end fires when the stream is finished and on create message fires when the new message is created. Which ones you use depends heavily on your backend logic. Typically, you would want to either stream these events back to the client or save them in your database. Now, to run your assistant with streaming, you need to use a new method called create and stream, passing your event handler as a parameter. Then you need to wait until the stream is done. While this thread is running, your event handler methods will be called with the corresponding events. So as you can see, our event handler now prints our assistant response and the code that was executed by code interpreter on OpenAI. That's the most basic example of how you can use streaming with assistants. However, most likely in production, your assistant will also need to utilize some custom tools. This is where it can get a bit more complex. Assistant creation process is the same. I will just replace the code interpreter with two custom tools, one to get the weather and the other to get a nickname of a city. Then, just like in the previous example, I will create a thread and add a message to this thread. However, now, before running it, we also need to save the run object, because we will need to submit our outputs to this object later. So after the stream is done, I will use another method called getFinalRun to save it globally. As you can see, the assistant called two functions, but the output has stopped. This is because now, to continue generating a response, Response, our assistant needs to know the results of those two function calls. In this example, I will just iterate through the two calls and pass some hard-coded values. In a real-world scenario, you would obviously need to incorporate your own unique logic based on the arguments provided by the assistant. After that, you need to submit these tool outputs. To do so, you need to run submit tool output stream. You can use the same event handler and then also add your function outputs. This will now continue running the thread that we have started before. As you can see, the assistant now generates a full response based on the two outputs we've submitted, stating that the weather is 75 degrees and the city's nickname is the Big Apple. Awesome. Now, obviously utilizing this in production can make your code base a bit complex. That's exactly what my framework aims to solve. It will automatically create your assistants, add messages, run threads, and submit tool outputs as needed, without you even having to think about it. So let me give you a glimpse of how you can achieve this with the help of agencies form. The process is pretty similar, however, with my framework, your code will be much cleaner in the end. The first step is to create our tools with the instructor library. Instead of executing your logic somewhere else in your code base, you can simply define it inside the run method. Here we will simply return our example values like before. Then we can proceed with creating our agent. Most of the parameters are almost the same, except in tools you must pass your tool classes defined above instead of schemas, which also makes your code cleaner by the way. Next you need to initialize the agency. In this example we'll simply use one agent, maybe I should call it a freelancer. After that we will define the event handler similar to the one we defined above. The only difference is that with my framework you must extend 
extend the agency event handler class, which has two additional properties for you, the agent name and the recipient agent name. You can use these properties to print the names of the agents conversing with one another. Also, there is an additional class method on all streams end, which is called when all streams have ended. This method is needed because unlike in the official OpenAI documentation, your event handler will be called multiple times and probably by even multiple agents. So, you can use this method to find out when the final response from the agency is completed. The final step is to simply run our agency using the new getCompletionStream method with this event handler. As you can see, the agent calls two functions just like before. However, now instead of you having to execute tools and submit the tool outputs manually, the framework does it for you and the agent seamlessly continues generating a response. This is an example for a custom backend integration. Alternatively, you can simply use the demo gradio method to run a gradio interface or the run demo method to run this agency from the terminal. Both of these methods already use streaming by default. In conclusion, as I promised, let me provide you with some production tips and explain how we are implementing this feature on our SaaS platform. Before you begin, it's important to review your existing infrastructure because some backend technologies don't support streaming at all. For instance, our SaaS backend was fully developed using serverless functions on Google Cloud, which unfortunately have this exact limitation. So what we're going to do next is transfer a part of our application responsible for generating model responses to Google Cloud Run. Google Cloud Run is also a serverless platform. However, instead of running single functions, it is designed to run stateless containers, which have a lot fewer limitations. If you're interested in more details about my experience launching an AI SaaS product, such as the server costs or the development process, let me know in the comments and I'll make a separate video on that later. So after you've decided on your infrastructure setup, the next step is to choose the right protocol for streaming. Here you have three options. You can either use server-side events, WebSockets or gRPC. Web WebSockets and gRPC are bidirectional communication standards, meaning that you can not only receive generated tokens from the backend, but also send events back to the server. However, for most LLM chat-based applications, I believe that bidirectional communication standards may be an overkill. This is because there are rarely any events that you need to send back to the server while generating a response. So for most LLM applications, I would actually recommend using server-side events because of their simplicity. With SSE, you can set up a stream with just a few lines of code on both the server and the client. Moreover, it is built on top of the HTTP protocol, which integrates seamlessly with all modern web browsers. This is how we are personally going to implement this on our SaaS platform very soon. However, for the exact details on how to do this, I recommend chatting with ChatGPT because this heavily depends on your technology stack. My job here was to make sure that you know the right questions to ask. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.